From Global, leading Britain's conversation, Cross Question, with Ian Dale. Hello, good evening and welcome to Cross Question, LBC's weekly political panel debate show. We'll be here in, here in LBC's Westminster studio each Wednesday at 8pm on the dot to answer questions from you LBC listeners. Now, as well as listening to us on the radio, you can watch us on Global Player and on LBC's YouTube, Facebook and Twitter feeds. Uh, if you'd like to take part in the show and ask our panel a question, all you have to do is pick up the phone and dial 0345 6060 the Lines are open now, and of course, all previous episodes of the program are on the Cross Question podcast. And this show will appear there before midnight tonight. It's time to introduce our panel. I'm joined here in the Westminster studio by the Business and Health Minister Nadim Zahawi, Labour MP for Birmingham Ladywood, Shabana Mahmood, writer and broadcaster Trevor Phillips, and from FTI Consulting political consultant Anita Boateng. Welcome to you all. Let's kick off with our first question, and it is is from Lisa in Haywards Heath. Lisa, what would you like to ask the panel? Oh, hi. I'd like to know whether the panel think that we're fully prepared for the rollout of the vaccine, most specifically to do with logistics and staffing. Well, I think we need to go to the Minister for Vaccine Deployment. That is your new title, I think, Nadim, isn't it? I guess you're going to say the answer is yes. But what are the main challenges that Lisa's referring to here? Uh, good evening, Lisa. You're absolutely right to ask this question. So the main challenge is deployment, uh, as well as obviously the supply chain. Um, now, this vaccine that's been approved, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, requires uh, it to be stored at minus 70 degrees centigrade, uh, which makes it quite challenging to both the sort of the, the cold chain supply, as it's called, but also then to deployment. And what we're doing, Lisa, is deploying in hospital hubs. So we did 70 in total across the United Kingdom in the four nations uh, yesterday. We're adding more to that. And then uh, next week, we'll start with um, primary care networks. These are the GP networks um, that uh, serve areas with about 30 to 50,000 population. But how does that work? Because they, they can't have fridges that go down to 70 degrees, Correct. presumably. Correct. So what happens is uh, you effectively thaw the, the uh, vaccine and then it can be held up to um, 120 hours at right. 2 to 8 degrees centigrade um, so they have got those fridges available to them um, and then as we have other vaccines come online and of, of course the MHRA the regulator is looking uh, at the uh, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine that is in many ways much easier to handle uh, then we will have vaccination large vaccination centers to be able uh, to uh, really ramp up the uh, number of people we can vaccinate every day but what i'm trying to do and this is really you know the, the the thing that i would say and i've been saying on my social media and any appearance i make is we've got to be really careful really deliberately careful to get the operations right i've got the uh, military across the board um, uh, embedded with the NHS, doing an amazing job of working together. Uh, How does that work? Because I can imagine there might be a clash from time to time there. Well, actually, quite the opposite. Because they've been doing a lot of planning for many months, the one really great thing we did, and if we look back, there's many things to learn from, you know, uh, that, that, that along the way didn't you know, operationalise it in his, you know, uh, positive way as we did yesterday with the vaccine but the one thing that we did really really well in the UK is one to create the vaccines task force led by Kate Bingham and her team where we were the first country to talk to BioNTech the first country then to talk to Pfizer as well as BioNTech and then talk to them together and then to option the other six vaccine candidates and as soon as we did that the NHS very quickly begun the planning process to say right we're going to plan as if a vaccine is going to come along. And I've got to pay tribute to Matt Hancock because he always believed that whether it's pre-Christmas or after Christmas, one of these vaccines will deliver, or if not more than just one. So the NHS, before my time, I take no credit for this whatsoever, put in a team, a really, really high quality team, uh, to begin the planning process of, okay, how do we deploy if it's a vaccine that requires cold chain storage or a vaccine that doesn't require that, how are we going to deploy it? How do we then ramp up? How do we recruit more vaccinators? How do we recruit the support staff that go with them? So there's a planning, there's a morning meeting every day, seven days a week, 
8 a.m., run actually by the military uh, and totally integrated in NHS England. Um, and, and what's that? Sorry, I didn't... I said, don't be late. Oh, never. <laughs> N- absolutely. I mean, it literally r- runs uh, uh, to the second, um, which is what they, they do so brilliantly. Uh, and, um, you know, really incredible people uh, that are that are working uh, on this so i'm confident that you know we will do this and we'll do it well um, but we have to be really deliberate and careful which is why you know i'm deliberately not sort of you, and you can't at this stage set sort of timelines and dates because I don't know whether I've, I only have a single vaccine. I've got to wait for the MHRA to see whether they approve uh, future vaccines, including the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, and then it, it, next year will be the bulk of the vaccination programme. So as Minister for Vaccine Deployment, what, what do you do? What is your role in this? Cause you're obviously not sort of driving the trucks around. You, you, you're almost like a puppet master, I guess, are you? So my role is very much to work with the team um, to, in many ways, uh, uh, yeah, I think why, why the Prime Minister called me is because I, I love uh, sort of operational um, uh, uh, processes because it's a little bit in my background before I entered Parliament um, uh, as Stephen Shakespeare my, my co-founder at YouGov tweeted out saying congratulations you're quite good at this sort of stuff aren't you um, anyway I hope I am and I hope I can prove to the nation that I can uh, uh, I can demonstrate to the nation I can do this really well so it's about operational um, uh, uh, confidence um, and working with the team to make sure that we understand each and every part of the process uh, from you know the vaccine at the manufacturing plant the way it, it comes into the country with AstraZeneca Oxford the bulk of it is manufactured in the UK uh, which is in many ways great news for us if it is uh, approved by the MHRA which they've been doing a rolling assessment but they'll have to still do a final approval in the same way they did with with Pfizer BioNTech um, and then deployment. How do you how do you make sure that you know everything that is happening and every day has challenges because you know it's it's a sort of you know supply side and then a, a sort of demand and deployment side. And, and you said the eyes of the. So I'm spending a little bit longer with you than I probably will do with um, the other three panelists on this, but I think as as you are the minister for this, we, we need to spend a little bit of time talking about it. Um, it's not just the eyes of the country that are on you, though, presumably, because we are the first to roll this out. You've got counterparts in other countries ringing you up saying, Nadine, we need to know what were the difficulties that you faced so we can learn from that. Have you had those calls from France, Germany, America, wherever? Very much so. Um, I was actually today speaking to my Canadian counterpart. Uh, again, they're looking to the UK in terms of learning some of the lessons around deployment. Um, in, on the Vaccines Task Force, we were in constant contact with our uh, European colleagues. Initially, uh, one of the first decisions we had to make was to say whether we go into the European um, sort of uh, buying system, effectively, or optioning of, of vaccines. And we took the decision, actually, that we didn't need to... We were much further ahead uh, in that sense. Um, and, and that really happened because the PM took a decision to bring in Kate Bingham and the, and the Vaccines Task Force. We, we're lucky in the UK because, actually, our life sciences sector... Um, is populated with incredible talent that we could pull, call upon to do this. Uh, and then we speak to the Americans all the time um, uh, in terms of where they are at as well. The regulators talk to each other, the chief medical officers talk to each other. By the way, the chief medical officer of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have been working you know, incredibly well to, to, to really coordinate this so that yesterday uh, we all vaccinated at the same time. Shivana, uh, this is an interesting one, isn't it? Because there have been so many issues where the opposition has quite rightly criticised the government for maybe getting something wrong or not doing something fast enough, too little, too late. We've heard that a lot. Here, it does seem to have gone rather well so far, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, look, I mean, Nadim and I have lots of uh, political differences. We know each other well as both of us are West Midlands uh, members of Parliament and we're both elected at the same time. But I am honestly willing him on to be the most successful Minister for Vaccine Deployment uh, because that is what is needed for our country. That's what is in our national uh, interest. And I hope that he and his team will learn the lessons of the other programmes that the government has implemented during the course of the pandemic, which, if we're being fair, I hope Nadim sort of felt like he was also admitting have gone 
you know, wrong and uh, where things have not worked as they should. And there's been a lot of bluster and then not a lot of action. And that knocks confidence. And I think with a vaccine, confidence is incredibly mm. important. People need to feel, you know, really strong about it. And that's why the optics of it matter. That's why, you know, um, being in complete control of the process is really important. So I'm really willing Nadim on to succeed. I think uh, we're all willing him on to succeed. We want this rollout to be successful uh, and a good example of the nation pulling together. If I could give him one bit of advice, it would be please listen to local uh, authorities, local NHS. Um, uh, people, it would be please listen to local uh, authorities, local NHS, best advantaged by the government uh, over the course of the pandemic. But on this, it's crucial. Um, it sounds like that's what you're doing. And, you know, please make sure that that is embedded because I think that will make the rollout successful. What, what are you hearing from your constituents on this? Because I get lots of people phoning in um, saying, look, this, it, this this has been developed in too short a time. They can't possibly have done the testing uh, well enough. That There are people who I would describe as COVID hesitant, not anti-vaxxers, but people who have genuine concerns. Yeah. Are you getting a lot of that? I, I have picked up that. I've had constituents writing to me. I've had members of my family ask me, and it's exactly that. It's not anti-vaccination. You know, these are people who absolutely want to be vaccinated but they are hesitant um, and there's a lot of misinformation out there and they're not quite sure how to judge that information what is you know fact and what is uh, spin from you know um, negative uh, actors so I think I think there is a bit of hesitancy and that's why you know projecting confidence from the government making sure the rollout is successful really clear communication strategy is going to be crucial uh, so that people can feel you know confident and, and proud to spread the message about the vaccination. Well, in, ju in just speech. on that, Anita Boateng, you're a communications professional. Uh, you've worked inside government as well. Um, yesterday, and it's not often we've said this during the pandemic, they, the, whoever was responsible, whether it's NHS England, whoever, got the comms absolutely spot on, didn't they? I completely agree. And I'm glad that you mentioned the issue around COVID hesitancy, because I'm a bit concerned that the narrative is building that actually there's lots of anti-vaxxers in our country. And actually, if you look at the polling, that's just not supported. You know, this is not the US. But there are people who quite reasonably are asking questions about their understanding of how long it normally takes for a vaccine to develop. And so it's really, really important that we have a lot of experts out there explaining why it was done you know in a relatively short order namely because they were able to examine the data as it came in and particularly speaking um as someone as a member of the bme community there has been a lot of kind of these whatsapp conspiracy theories and some of those conversations happening that i've also seen in my community i'm a counselor um in in london and so it's really important that we get out there we disband some of these myths and we really try to in, 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 give people the real confidence that this vaccine is safe and effective. Um, Trevor Phillips, let's go back to Lisa's question, which is, does the panel think that uh, we're prepared enough for a nationwide vaccine rollout? What's your verdict so far? Well, uh, how, how can anyone know? It feels to me like we are doing the best that can possibly be done. And if I may just say, Ian, that, of course, you're probably going to be thrown out of LBC after this because you've got two MPs on who started the programme by talking sense. And that's really, generally speaking, <laughs> unacceptable. Well, that's what uh, we try and I do on this programme, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we've got you I on, Trevor. With, <laughs> I agree with both what Matt and him said and also uh, what Shabana said. Um, and this point about anti-vaxxers is, is important. The... Only point I would make is you don't need very many anti-vaxxers to make this a problem, actually. Uh, don't forget, this is uh, a condition that is spread exponentially. And that really, I think people don't ever quite understand what exponential means. It means you only need a few people to make something spread very, very fast. Uh, I, I, too, would, Will, um, will on uh, Nadim, I know he's got a proper background, speaking as a business person, it's terrific to get that government is prepared to put something in the hands of somebody who has actually done something outside politics. I, I'm very much in favour of that. And good luck to you, mate.
On Thank the team, you're feeling the love tonight. I don't know whether that's going to continue for the rest of the programme. I suspect not. But uh, anyway, uh, keep your calls coming. 0345 973 And do watch us on LBC. Text 84850. 20 past eight on LBC. Let me reintroduce my panel. Shabana Mahmood is Labour MP for Birmingham Ladywood. Nadim Zahawi is Business and Health Minister. Trevor Phillips, writer and broadcaster. And Anita Boateng, former special advisor, I uh, should say to Brandon Lewis, and also now political consultant with FTI Consulting. Let's go to our next caller. It's Gavin in Hounslow. Hello, Gavin. Hi, Ian. What would you like um, to ask? Well, it, 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 uh, what, what does the panel think is um, likely to be the outcome in the event that we do leave without a deal? I mean, it, it's, it, it's kind, kind of a strange one because no, no country's ever left the, the EU before. And, you know, it, it, the, 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 main, the, the main sort of consensus is that, like, it's all going to be doom and gloom and, you know, we're going to... We're, we're going to fail before we even start, which is, you know, not the best of mentalities to have. But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just be, be, be keen to hear what, um, what their okay. views would be. All right, Trevor Phillips, let's start with you. It will not be the end of the world, OK? <laughs> let's just start with that. I know that the, the, this is always going to be discussed in massively apocalyptic terms, but it really isn't. And to be absolutely frank, in my political book, it is probably the ninth or tenth most important thing that faces this country behind, for example, the millions of jobs that will be lost or displaced by digital technology within the next decade, behind competition from China, behind the fact that we've got a lot more old people that you are going to, including me, you're going to have to pay for over the next uh, 10 years. These things, frankly, dwarf the importance of what uh, are leaving the European Union. Having said that, I know nobody's going to buy that, but that's, in my view, the reality. Will it make a huge difference? Well, it will make quite a big difference. I would rather we hadn't left. I would rather we hadn't left. But we are where we are. I hope that the Prime Minister gets some deal so we can get this thing behind us and actually address the far bigger issues that are confronting our country. And if I just, for example, make one point, as you know, Ian, I was um, for some years president of a big retailer for four or five years. We have 85,000 people um, working for us. We know that in the next two or three years, there won't be cashiers. The, we know that with, by the middle of this decade, there will be something like a million retail jobs lost out of four million. That is what matters. Shabana Mahmood. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I, I, is this I just, where the consensus shatters? <laughs> not, not, not entirely. I mean, I, I do agree with Trevor about sort of apo apocalyptic and catastrophic language, um, because I think that Brexit is a reality. The general set, uh, election settled that question, and we do have to make the best of it. And you know, for my own, for my, from my own perspective, I, I want to back us as a country, back us, our people, our businesses to succeed in the future. Um, but no deal is going to be, you know, it is going to lead to an economic. Hit, things will change. The most visual of those will be things like queues at the border, for example. Tariffs mean prices go up. Some prices may come down as well, actually, from goods that we uh, get in from other parts of the world. But that kind of economic uncertainty, you know, we will be in for a period where things feel very, very difficult. What the medium and the long term then looks like, wh whether we get a deal or not, it's, let's see how things go uh, in Brussels this evening. Um, I, I think that's all to play for. And actually, one of the things that has baffled me most over the last few years is that the, the key architects of Brexit and the Vote Leave campaign, you know, Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, um, I, I will never forget that image of them that morning of the result looking absolutely ashen faced and as if they were in mourning and I kind of think that um, well, they were David Cameron had just resigned well I know but but the thing is that if this is your life's work and this is a project that you believe is absolutely representing well, it wasn't the Boris's best, life's work was no it? indeed but then he pitched onto it and he became quite a vocal proponent of it then I wish that we would hear more about uh, what the win is and what that medium to long term future is going to look at because I think people have priced in that 
short term, it will be difficult and there'll be lots of change, some expected, some unexpected. But what is that medium term vision? Where is it all to play for? Because I sort of think there's a bit about low tax, low regulation, Singapore. It's probably not what the Red Wall thinks they voted for uh, when they when uh, they were supporting Brexit or uh, Boris Johnson as prime minister. There are trade-offs, there are choices to be made. And I kind of wish that the proponents of this big political project that is a massive change for how we how we run our country, how we run our economy, would actually spell out some of those choices that they want to see made so we can start to see the shape of it. Because in the medium term, I want my party to make the best of it as well. And I want us to be able to chart a course for our country, which will be very different to the Conservatives, but that will take advantage of Brexit. But we sort of need to see what that win looks now, like. Now, may, maybe you can answer a question which your leader singularly failed to answer at Prime Minister's question. I know he's supposed to be asking the questions, but you know how it works. Um, do you think that the Labour Party should vote for a deal if there is a deal? Well, there isn't a deal at the moment, so I can't vote for something that doesn't yet exist. But um, my my feeling is, if there is a deal, I would like us to be in a position to support it, po- to positively support mm. it and vote for it. It is it is completely in the realms of possibility that Boris Johnson might negotiate something that is worse than no deal. I wouldn't put it past him. But um, uh, So I can understand why we would say we want to look at it first. But I want us to make a positive choice because I think... S- Firstly, it's important that we demonstrate to the voters... You can't abstain, can you? No, I, I think it's important that we demonstrate positively to the voters that lost faith with us at the last election, having voted Labour all their lives, uh, lost faith with us over Brexit, that you know we have heard the message loud and clear. But I also think psychologically, it's important for us to turn our minds to the post-Brexit future and to consider more positively that medium to long-term okay. vision for the country. And I think it's important um, to do that. Anita Boateng, that is a fair criticism, isn't it, of the leading... Brexiteers who, over the last four years, I think, have been either reluctant or unable to portray this positive vision of a post-Brexit Britain beyond the fact that we'll be free to do free trade deals with lots of other countries. There has to be more to it than that. Well, I think anyone that thinks that Boris Johnson doesn't have an optimistic vision of what Brexit might be, I think is fooling themselves. I think he's honestly been one of the most optimistic proponents of Brexit that we have seen. And on this question about beyond wanting to do trade deals, I mean, let's not forget that that is a really important part of Britain's economy. Like we are, uh, we have a huge service economy. We have a fantastic life sciences sector, as Nadim has said, and there are amazing things that we can do around the world. And I do think that that is a very optimistic vision of what our country can be. I also think that this point around freedom and sovereignty is not just about rhetoric. As we have discussed, there are huge challenges coming down the track for, you know, whether it, whether it comes to technology, whether it comes to skills, the issues around how we get enough skills into this country and how we train up our employees. All of these challenges, the British public have very clearly said, we want our UK government to decide how it tackles those challenges. And we want to be able to bluntly throw you out if we're fed up of how you're dealing with those things. And so I do think that this really, that is the vision and that really matters. And that is a prize worth fighting for. Just to add, I am pretty optimistic that we're not going to be in a no deal scenario. And I think that this negotiation is happening right now in good faith. So let's see what happens. Well, let, let's hope so. Um, Nadim, you, you must have, uh, as a business minister, loads of business people on the phone to you every day saying, look, you know, as a former businessman yourself, we want certainty. Well, it's three weeks to go till the 31st of December. And um, we were talking about, Gavin was saying, oh, well, people all would say it's gloom and doom. Well, when they see 10,000 acre lorry parts being built in the Kent countryside, and saying lorry drivers are going to have to have passports to go through Kent. I mean, is it any wonder people think it's gloom and doom? Well, so when I speak to businesses, what you're absolutely right. What you, they do say is uh, we, we need to plan, we need certainty. Now, the one thing they all know and they recognise is that on the 1st of January, as Trevor Phillips quite rightly, I think, pointed out, we would have left the customs union and the single market. So they can absolutely plan for that now. So if you, you know, you exchange data with Europe, you need to plan now. If you have work in Europe or, or people from Europe coming to work in your business, then you need to plan now. All that stuff can happen now, irrespective of the outcome of what the future relationship, because what Gavin's question was is, you know, 
where are we? Have we left? We have left Gavin. Um, on the 1st January, we would have left the customs union and the single market. This is about the future relationship. Now, Michael Gove yesterday negotiated the joint committee, which is one of the big things on Northern Ireland. Businesses in Northern Ireland want to know that they can actually have unfettered access to the great British market and vice versa. That was all negotiated. So irrespective of what happens in these negotiations for the future deal, the joint committee has already agreed, which is a good thing, uh, around uh, Northern Ireland. That's a, that's a really important step. So that's more certainty for Northern Irish businesses and GB businesses that uh, trade with uh, Northern Ireland. Now, I think Shabana, actually, I can see why Keir hasn't put her on the front bench because he probably worries that she's going to lead the party because she can make decisions and he can't. Uh, but um, I might not agree with every word she says, but at least she can make decisions. Uh, but all I would all I would say is, Gavin, we've made preparations and Ian alluded to them. £700 million has gone into our ports. Uh, we're make, taking mitigating action just in case back to the lorries and, and actually making sure that trade continues to flow. Um, We've also, and this is back to the point, you know, that uh, Trevor was making earlier. You know, there are some things that will happen that are already happened that are to our advantage. You look at what Pretty Patel has done with immigration and the point space system. We can now project to the world, and today there's a picture of her standing with uh, people from Hong Kong who are now able to have a, a route to residency and ultimately to British citizenship uh, because we can make those decisions on our own. Around the world, the trade deals. Well, we that could, sorry, that, that's got nothing to do with leaving the. No, no, no. I'm saying we take back control of our immigration system. Sure, but of I course mean, it does. People here it, from no, Hong Kong, no, nothing no, to it do does with because you have the... to balance your immigration system as a whole. And if you have un, you know, uncontrolled migration from Europe, you are you are then stuck because you can't deliver that balance. The really important thing, which does concern my department, so I yeah. got all the regulators together. Um, the regulators in the United Kingdom together and I got the MHRA a it few months ago. an exciting meeting. It, well, it was. i tell you why. Because actually, one of the things <laughs> that was coming out from the, from the uh, round tables we were hosting in Bays around how do we, you know, post-COVID, how do we recover the economy, regulation came up as one of the top things that investors said the UK has always had a great history of having really good regulation that is proportionate and balanced. Um, so we brought the regulators together and actually... The MHRA presented to show how they got dexamethasone into the NHS, how they got this little gadget from uh, McLaren that helped lots of people stay off a mechanical ventilation, save many thousands of lives. But what yeah. they all said to me, what they all said to me is actually the big opportunity of us leaving the EU is that the one size fits all no longer applies. They have a real opportunity to do really good regulation, protect the consumer whilst making the UK the best okay. place to invest in. Trevor wants to come in. Yeah, look, I mean, you know, I want to be cool about all of this, but honestly, a lot of this is just guff. Of course, you're going to have to deal with it, and I have no doubt that uh, the machine will deal with it and so on. But to be honest, let's not get too starry-eyed about what's going to happen on the other side. I don't want to replay the the argument, we lost, okay, we're going to do it. But what you're not telling us is how we are going to deal with that new world in a convincing way. One central example. China is currently spending $600 billion buying friends across the world, buying markets, taking over ports. We, at the moment, appear to have no plan whatsoever in this bright new world where we're going to be trading across the globe to deal with the fact that somebody has already got there and eaten our lunch. Now, I don't want you to expect you to answer that completely 100%. I would just like you to be a bit more realistic with the British people about what Let me have a go. The future, 30 seconds. Right, what the future faces us. Okay, I'm going to give him 30 seconds to answer. I'm that. going to have one quick go in one particular sector, which is renewables. Today, we account for 36% of the whole planet's offshore wind generation, energy generation, offshore wind. Now, that, the Prime Minister wants us to quadruple to 40 gigawatts so that 
every home in the UK by 2030 can be powered by offshore wind. Massive billions of pounds came in from Scandinavia and other countries into that. More billions will come in. The, the Prime Minister's 10-point plan will deliver 250,000 new okay. jobs, green jobs. And that is the way, you, it's, the, it's, the, it's the green industrial revolution, Trevor. Well, there's one other benefit Remember, that I'm going to give you. Who owns the silicon chips? It's not us. All right. Okay. There's, there's one on. other benefit. We, we, we can ban live animal exports, which we could not do as members of the European here, here. Union. Um, I say that as an impartial host, obviously. <laughs> uh, we'll take more of your calls in a moment. 0345 6060 973, if you'd like to put a question to our panel. Uh, this is going. The next half an hour is going to be even more exciting than Nadim's meeting of regulators. 0345 6060 973. 8.39, if you've just tuned in our panel, Trevor Phillips, Anita Boateng, Nadim Zahawi and Shabana Mahmood. Let's go to our next caller, Julian's in Torquay. Hi, Julian. Hi, Ian. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. What does the panel feel about Millwall fans objecting to uh, players bending the knee, or do they agree with James Cleverley when he said that no-one should be intimidated into doing so? Anita Boateng. Well, first of all, I'm a bit sceptical that the reason why Millwall Falls fans were booing was because of concerns about the Black Lives Matter organisation itself and the idea that it's you know got political views and there's no room for politics in, um, in in this debate. So I think the first thing to say is that I think the general sentiment um, in favour of Black Lives is something that I very strongly support. And I, I think that it's right that we can talk about the Black Lives Matter organisation and talk about its political views, but ultimately I think what the sentiment of Black Lives Matter is something that a lot of people across the country, um, you know, hugely support. Um, I, I think booing is not something that I want to see in this country. And I think that it happens too often in football, um, kind of regardless. Um, and I also think that um, it's right that the, the Millwall calls out some of those players for that kind of behaviour. Um, and I think that we can all... It wasn't all the players, it was the fans. We should yes, make sure it wasn't the players, it was the it was some of the fans. Um Trevor Phillips. Well, short answer. It's Millwall, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> As a West Ham fan, who who am I to disagree? <laughs> I is mean, that, honestly, that... this, this, this club has a long history. It's always had this particular rather disgusting bunch of so-called fans. And I know the, club's tr the club has tried hard to get rid of them. It's failed. It's got to keep trying. But these people are not football fans. They're just morons. Well, they're racist, aren't they, Nadim? Let let's put our cards on the table. Well, so, uh, Julian, I think um, showing solidarity with um, uh, black footballers um, is something that we should all do. We can do it in different ways. You can take the knee, you can do different things. The reason I say that to you is because I'm a football fan as well. And last night... Did you support? PSG, I support Man U. I know, but um, don't hold it against me. But last night's match, well, well, we, no got, we had a terrible night last night against <laughs> Leipzig. But um, PSG against Basak Shahir here last night. I have to tell you, listening to Demba Bar, I don't know who said it, and there's going to be an inquiry, obviously, but listening to him saying that someone actually pointed at a black person and said that black man when you don't say that to a white person you don't go that white man over mm -hmm. there right racism is still uh, uh, rife clearly in the sport and needs to be stamped out i think it's right that footballers uh you know really come out and i thought you know good on them last night both teams um came off the pitch and stayed off the pitch because i was enraged when i heard Demba Bar say that you know the reason they they, they came off is because and it, it, I don't know who the person is and I don't want to you know, is that he he was pointing well, it's one at of the match officials and saying that black man I thought that was disgusting and I'm sorry Julian but I think anyone um, who in any way and I think I agree with Anita on this I don't think that people were booing there because they disagreed with a political um, uh, 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 you know. Um, Black Lives Matter movement. I disagree with their politics. I agree with 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 James Cleverly on on that point. By the way, no one should be bullied either into taking the knee. But I think we all need to uh, take a stand and show solidarity and stamp out racism wherever we find it. I know uh, this man next to me, Ian Dale, today when he announced this show, 
someone tweeted out saying, you know, 80% of Britain is, is white, yet you can't find any white people to come on the show. I think that's disgusting, and I'm glad Ian called it out tonight. Well, it is disgusting because, I mean, we haven't deliberately got a panel that is non-white. I mean, I am the token white person here tonight, and I'm, that's, that's, that, that's fine. We, we book people because we think they're interesting. Um, Shabana, but going back to the Millwall situation. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I sort of agree with, uh, with what's been said. I think it's very clear to everybody what those fans were communicating uh, with their booing. There's no debate to be had about that. Um, and it is right that, um, you know, the leadership at Millwall Football Club and the players have taken a stand against their own fans about it to try and call that behaviour out. There has there have been long-standing issues at that club um, and racism has no place in football um, and uh, I, I, I think that on that, trying to elide it into a wider debate about the nuances of Black Lives Matter as a, as a sort of moment of public consciousness raising about racism versus Black Lives Matter, the activist movement and their aims. I, I think that that's a bad faith argument in this context, because in this context, everybody knows when they were booing, we all know exactly what they were yeah. booing for. Uh, Julian, what's your view? Um, my view, I, tell, I don't know much about Millwall football. I'm not a football supporter. Keep it that way. But, I, I did listen to Majid Nawaz's show, and they did say that they were actually booing the Black Lives Matter movement, but they, they were not actually booing the fact that football's trying to erase racism. Um, I would agree well, with that. Well, I, I think, it, as Trevor says, if, if you know the history of Millwall Football Club, you will draw your own conclusions on that. But I think one of the main lessons over the last few minutes is that um, Nadim's regulatory meeting was so boring that he was looking at my Twitter feed. It's 8.45. <laughs> Nick Ferrari at break. Charlie, who's in Watford. Hi, Charlie. What would you like to ask? Good evening, Ian. Good evening to the panel. Um, my question is kind of, there's two elements to it. The first bit being, um, what is the government's strategy uh, with regards to prioritising vaccinations for those that have loved ones in care homes? I know that there's a current strategy for prioritising care home carers and individuals in care homes. Um, and my second part to that is, does your age as an individual that would visit a care home, I'm in my early 20s, my father is in a care home, uh, does that affect how I might be able to get the vaccine, if so? Well, I was going to go to Shabana first, but given that the question is really more directed towards Nadim, I'm, I'm going to start off with, with you and then I'll bring you in, Shabana. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, you're absolutely right to say that uh, it has to be an absolute priority and the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunisation has put care home residents at the top of that uh, list uh, with the over 80s and obviously then care home staff and and health uh, uh, workers as well. Um, so that is our priority um, as we move um, from the hospital hubs to the uh, primary care networks uh, we have a plan of getting to care homes before Christmas uh, to vaccinate all care home uh, residents as soon as possible. Um, we also have a testing uh, programme that uh, uh, Matt Hancock announced a couple of weeks ago uh, as a pilot in care homes uh, to make sure we try and uh, uh, deliver that access for uh, people to visit their loved ones and vice versa. Uh, and so it is a, it is a priority for us, uh, uh, the combination of both obviously testing and um, the vaccine, the vaccination. But in terms of Charlie being able to visit his father, yeah. I mean that that's a tricky one, isn't it? It is a tricky one, Charlie. And and in terms of obviously priority, and at the moment, I'm having to balance you know the limited supply that we have of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. The reason that's why we're prioritising care home residents at the top of that list of the nine categories. Why have we got fewer vaccines than we were expecting? Weren't we expecting a, mi a million, and we've only got eight hundred thousand? We've got more than that, right. uh, so we'll have a, be able to 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 do better than that. I just don't want to put a number on it, uh, and the reason I, I you know, I'm determined not to do that is because I want to make sure that we have, as we discussed at the beginning of the show, uh, the operation really um, uh, locked down and delivering. And but the, the manufacturers must be producing sort of zillions of. Uh, examples of this vaccine um nobody else has actually given it regulatory approval yet is, is it going to be stacking up in f fridges in belgium or something I mean, can we not get a few more uh, well we've got um uh, i think you know uh, 
I think we've we've done really well. We've got a few. You're itching to tell me, aren't we've you? Got, I um, uh, well, <laughs> we've <laughs> done. We've, look, we've done. We, we we were the first to uh, be, be agree a, a, a contract with them. I must push you. Man. We have a few million uh, 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 vaccines uh, uh, coming in, but the bulk, as I've said before, will be next year. Um, and we've got to get this right. It's a marathon, not a sprint, and we have to take it you know, really deliberately, carefully, because the worst thing we can do is race ahead and get it wrong okay. and have high wastage. But, uh, Charlie, you know, really important, and it's my absolute priority to get into care homes and vaccinate all care home residents. Shaban, is this something where it, it is more or less impossible to introduce a, a perfect system here? Because there will always be people who think, well, I don't understand why that group is more of a priority than that group. Um, and everyone can disagree on that, but in the end, someone's got to make a decision. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's going to be some trade-offs here, there's going to be some difficult choices, and when you're in the world of deciding priorities, um, uh, you know, th that is going to be difficult. And But I, th I think the public um, have probably internalised that. They've priced that in. They do understand that. I, I think on care homes, though, there's been such an emotional trauma, uh, uh, you know, suffered by residents of care homes and their families. It's just so incredibly difficult uh, what they've been going through that, uh, you know, that kind of moral and emotional case is just really powerful and strong. You know, these are some of the most vulnerable people in our society and no human contact really is, is has taken a a big toll and so I think that again as vaccine rollout happens it needs to be good local uh, knowledge be feeding in into the rollout so that we can make sure that care homes are front and centre of that package uh, as and when it's um, when it's fully operationalised. On priority I mean I was lobbying Nadim about the situation in Birmingham when during one of the ad breaks because you know we're not in, 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 in the first phase uh, of rollout uh, every area will have its own case to make and he, he'll expect me to make the case for Birmingham as passionately as I can as will the rest of my colleagues. Uh, we do understand choices have to be made, but I think Charlie and anybody else who's got a loved one, uh, a parent, you know, somebody with dementia in a care home, just that trauma I think that people have been through, we need to remember that there's a human cost beyond death and long COVID and the disease itself. And, and it's that separation from families, which uh, I think we can put right if the rollout goes successfully, which is why we all wish him well with it. Anita. Um, well, first of all, Charlie, thanks for your question, because certainly as a counsellor, the most harrowing stories I've heard have been um, in care homes. And, and to say that this is not a challenge that's unique to England, like there have been a high proportion of deaths in care homes right across Europe, including countries like Spain, I mean, um, including Norway, you know, this is a, a huge issue. Um, I think specifically, the thing that I want to say is that we really have to make sure that the information about asymptomatic um, um, abilities to, to contract and spread the disease are really very clear because this vaccine unfortunately is not necessarily the end of the road and it's really important that we continue to you know listen to the advice as it comes through because it's not necessarily the only thing that's going to ensure that we really get a handle on this virus and I think it's just really important when you're considering decisions around not just vaccinations but also how and when you continue to you know visit family when that's available that all of the advice is taken into account. Trevor. Well, uh, I can't, can't disagree with what's been said, but I just want to put one thing on Nadim's, uh, Mark Nadim's card about one one thing. What, one, of the, one of the things that COVID has taught us is that modern medicine is really going to run on data. The central thing in dealing with this particular with this pandemic has been, what do we know? In what detail do we know uh, about it? And one of the things it's going, we know for certain, there's gonna be at least nine months or a year before we've got this thing under control. Uh, you know, we're in a good place now and it's very hopeful. One of the things that I worry about is that I look at the um, list of vaccine priorities published by the Joint Committee for Vaccine and Immunization. And it has care homes, correct, age, correct, and so on. For the best part of eight or nine months, we've been being told that uh, one of the big risk factors is ethnicity. Suddenly, when it comes to actually deciding who gets this thing first, We've got all shy about that factor. And I know what the orthodox line is. The orthodox line is that the ethnicity is not in itself a factor, it's age and occupation and all of that. But Nadim, particularly because he's, he's mathematically capable, will understand what I mean when the fact is that risk 
coalesces. And we know that it is coalescing around ethnic groups. One of our problems is we do not know which ones. And I think one of the real scandals of this thing, which we'll, come, which we'll discover when it's finished, is we do, we've never discovered, we never did the work to understand which groups were most at risk. For example, mm -hmm. coming back to care homes, who works in those care homes? The biggest single uh, indicator, your Filipino social or health worker. We don't know what their, risk, their level of risk is. Okay, Trevor, thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to read out this email from Mary, going back to the question about uh, Millwall fans. Um, I'm listening on the radio. I don't think I'm allowed to watch you live as I don't have a TV licence. You can, Mary, if you've got a computer. Uh, I can't tell you whether your guests are black, white, yellow or green, and I care even less. A blind person must wonder what all the fuss is about. The majority of British people are mixed race. It's just not obvious if both those races happen to be white. It's just a shame that racism continues to be an issue. Um, final text question. Uh, this is um, from uh, Millie in Onga. William Shakespeare was the second person to be vaccinated in the UK yesterday. If they had to, what Shakespeare character do the panel think they would play? Um, well, I have to come to the Member of Parliament for Stratford-upon-Avon yeah. first, don't I? <laughs> Thank you. And just that last point from, from Trevor. Uh, Trevor, uh, care home workers are also in the priority uh, list, so we are absolutely cognizant of that fact, whether they are uh, from the Philippines or elsewhere. Um, Shakespeare and the Member for Stratford-upon-Avon, well, I would say two characters. Henry V, for his extraordinary bravery, um, and probably Othello for his passion and probably fallibility. Anita. <laughs> That's a very good answer, Nadine. I would probably say Portia from The Merchant of Venice because she doesn't think much of her suitors. <laughs> and also she, um, she disguises herself as a man to kind of get her way. So I quite like the idea of being quite nefarious. <laughs> Well, I once played opposite Portia in Merchant of Venice. Believe it or not, I played Shylock. Trevor. <laughs> it's interesting. Everybody goes, goes for the, the hero, Caesar, Othello, Hamlet. Uh, no, it didn't end well for those guys, actually. So, <laughs> 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 Very I true. Uh, if, I, if I had a choice, it would probably be um, Benedict from Much Ado About Nothing, because A, he has the best jokes, and also he gets the girl or Falstaff, who just does nothing but have the most outrageous fun until he falls over dead. <laughs> Shabana, beat that. Uh, I, well, I don't think I can beat it. I can, uh, I, I can agree with it because I studied Othello for both my GCSEs and my A-levels, so I feel like I know That's that cheating. play off by heart. <laughs> and I have played every character, and I thought I did a good Othello, but everybody at school told me my Iago was better, and I had a lot of existential angst about it, but it is because the villains are actually uh, the best, I think, in terms of Shakespeare. <laughs> I think you've got a fantastic Iago, whatever that is. <laughs> Thank you very much to all four of you for joining us tonight. Shabana Mahmoud, Nadim Zahawi, Trevor Phillips, and Anita Poitang. You can catch up with Cross Question on the podcast feed. Uh, coming up next on LBC, we're going to be talking Brexit. Love to hear your uh, phone calls. Let's try and imagine what the conversation has been like between Boris Johnson and Ursula von der Leyen this evening. 0345 6060 973. And what are you imagining might come out of it? You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's one minute past nine.